It's time to begin our worship service this evening. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go through the, the list of those who are sick since there's several changes uh, compared to what's in the bulletin. Um, Danny Carpenter Sr. And, and Tenny are recovering from a bout with COVID. They were able to be here this morning. Um, Ed O'Dell is recovering well uh, after his minor procedure last week. He's here today. Um, Nancy Van Meter is dealing with cancer. She's doing good now and has received treatments. Ruth Ann Lemon has a couple of uh, different medical tests coming up. She will have a doctor's appointment on September 17th. And it was good to see her out this morning. Rhonda's dad is, is going to wound care for his foot. Doug Louderman, who is Tara's cousin, is, uh, is in rehab. Um, Donnie Hendershot's cancer may have spread. He will have a biopsy soon, and his heart is doing pretty good. Marsha Haddix has been diagnosed with cancer, and we'll see an oncologist soon. Karen Krentiti, uh, Teresa Piggott, uh, her stress test was normal, and they released her from the hospital on Thursday. Morgan Sill uh, just had a baby girl in Columbus and is in an induced coma with cardiomyopathy. Um, Bill Spears fell and hurt himself last week. And Helen May is dealing with cancer. I'm sorry, COVID. <clears throat> Dwayne McCumbers uh, recently had heart surgery. Aaron Anderson is in Cleveland Clinic with serious medical conditions. Aaron, or Carson Elrod, a uh, camp kid that was in a bad auto accident Friday, was taken to Ruby and he is not doing well. And Terry Stats, friend of Roy Clark, uh, has an aortic aneurysm. And Jeannie. Stepped in a hole last night, twisted her ankle. Um, please remember all these folks in, in your prayers for speedy recovery. Uh, we're sad to announce that Rita Henderson passed away. Please remember her family and friends in your prayers. Is there any other announcements? Um, I mentioned my coworker's mother came up with Um, anyone else? We need to remember the All right. Tomorrow evening will be the elders and preachers meeting. Uh, please see myself, Ed, or else you have something that needs to be brought up. This coming Friday, we will be hosting the Friday night scene here at Sunrise. If you haven't already signed up to bring food, please look on the list. There's still a few spots available. <coughs> Um, also, please plan to attend that. Uh, next Sunday will be our three buffet members. Please remember to bring a, a covered dish to share. Um, and that's all. Uh, 
the 28th we will be hosting our fall festival here if you can help with that please let me know um, appreciate any help we can get for sure um, is there any other announcements that need to be made this evening Will is going to be leading our singing everybody join in First song will be number 175. And you'll never believe who I saw today. Chris Enoch. And I didn't recognize him. He had lost so much weight. His hair's grown out really long. And his beard is down to here. But he's up and about and says he's doing fine. So I just thought you all would appreciate hearing about that. He's my king. All day long, God, Jesus, I am singing. He, my song of joy, will ever be. All the while, He keeps my heart bells ringing. For His love is everything to me. He is my King, and judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his way. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this time in prayer. Again, Father, with uh, thanksgiving on our hearts, Father, for the, the beautiful day you've given us and the opportunity that you've given us to live in this uh, free country where we are free to come and worship you. 
Uh, we pray, Father, that as we enter into this worship service tonight, that the, everything that's said and done will be pleasing unto you. We pray, Father, that you'd help us all to keep our minds um, focused on worshiping you this evening. We pray, Father, for all those who were mentioned who were sick and dealing with different issues. That we just pray, Father, that uh, you would help them as you see fit. Uh, we pray also, Father, that you forgive each and every one of us where we have sinned against you and fallen short. Uh, just guide our decisions and help us to uh, resist the temptations that are put before us. And we pray, Father, all these things through your Son, Jesus' holy name. Amen. Five seventeen. The church is one foundation in Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water.
Sunday evening and, and open the Word of God and, and to study it. Uh, uh, we'll be looking, our main passage is from 1 Samuel chapter 8, but we're going to be jumping around to some Old Testament passages uh, in uh, some other books, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and those uh, uh, types of books. So if you want to open towards 1 Samuel chapter 8, that's fine with me. Uh, I appreciate Roy leading the songs, talking about He is my King. He is my king. As Christians, that's really all we have to worry about. You might say, well, what about this leader or that leader or the other leader? I, I you know, we get out, vote, we do what we need to do, but uh, uh, our concern needs to be with Jesus, our king, because our king is in charge and our king is in control and that's what we need to worry about. And, and you know, this has been a little bit of a problem for a long time. Because if you look back at the children of Israel, they've had some leadership problems over the years. And we'll see that they wanted a king, and it, it, what they did is they decided not to depend so much on God and depend on man. And kind of said, well, we can appoint a king, we can be just like everybody else, we can be like all the nations around us and do the exact same thing. And what they forgot to really realize is that they already had a king and their king was God. And their king was leading them and helping them and providing for them and giving them everything they needed. And when they turned to a king, they almost kind of turned away from God. Now, don't forget that God had his hand in making them a king. So we'll look at this tonight. You know, the scripture starts out in kind of a weird way, and it starts out with the age of Samuel. And as was read just a moment ago, it says, and that came about when Samuel was old. Now, now we all have a, a different idea of what old is, but they begin to look at him and say, it seems like Samuel is a little too old to be a judge. He's a little too old to be in charge. Maybe he's not making the decisions that we would like, and certainly that might have been the case. And it's not described exactly how old he is, but later in chapter 12, so we're at 8 now, we go all the way to chapter 12, verse 2, he's described as old and gray. But he does not die. It's not recorded in chapter 25. And so we have a, a long time before we get there. And so he didn't live long enough to see the kingship of Saul and the anointing of King David. So we know that even though we call him old at that point in time, he still had some life left to give. So practically speaking, they, they rendered decisions based on their own greed and, and not on the standards set by a, a sovereign God when they decided they wanted to do things their own way. Talking about the sons. Now he mentioned this when he read the passage. The sons didn't turn out too good. Now if we look at Samuel and, and we look at his life and, and he was raised by the priest Eli and, and he seemed to be doing well and wonderful and seemed to be certainly a man of God. He would think, well certainly his sons would be men of God. But we can't control our children always. And, and so, you know, we saw them begin to take a turn and, and they turned aside to dishonest gain, made money in dishonest ways. And, and they would take a bribe, if you will. And, and they would pervert justice. So they would do things that just weren't right. And so we see that, that, that they would be not be the judges that uh, God would want them to be. We'll look at a couple of things or three things tonight. First, we see 
Uh, now appoint a king. So there's the demand. In chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, we see that all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to Samuel, Behold, you've grown old. That must have hurt Samuel's feelings, I think. You've grown old. You know, when somebody looks at you and says, You've just grown old. Okay, well, you're not any younger either, is probably what I would have said. Your sons do not walk in your ways. That's kind of a shameful moment for Samuel. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the other nations. Now, we don't see Samuel's emotion yet, but we'll see it soon. This was not a high moment in the life of Samuel. For several things, first of all, his son, second of all, because they are telling him to, that the judge system that, that Samuel's kind of been in charge of for a long time isn't working out. They want a different type of government system. And since Samuel was old and probably less able to do the work of a judge, he appointed his two sons over Israel, and it was fitting that all the elders of Israel gathered together approach him with their concerns at Ramah. However, Israel's motives in this matter were wrong in pretense they cited age, having grown old, and wickedness of a son. So their, their motives or their reasoning to make this decision was wrong to start with. And when you use wrong reasoning, normally this decision is, is most likely wrong. And Israel's desire to be like other nations, contrary to God's prior directions, was a direct strike against the sovereignty of God. We'll get to this in a second, but God gave them a plan and they went a different direction. It's kind of like if you go ask somebody, how, how do you want me to do this? And they say, hey, well, this is, I want you to do A, B, C, and D. And then you go and do something totally opposite. That's kind of the children of Israel. They, they, they seem to be a, a very rebellious group. That they, and, and, and so many times they would do this. Leviticus 20 and, and verse 26, thus you are to be holy. This is God. You're to be holy for I am the Lord. I am holy. I have set you apart from the people to be mine. Now this word holy, one definition of it is you're to, you're to be different. You're to be different. In other words, you're not to be like the rest of the nation. You're not to be like the rest of the world. You're not to be like the rest of the people. When they look at you, they need to see what? God. You're what? God's people. You would expect that out of Israel. You know, if you look at an Israelite, you expect a certain thing. When people look at Christians today, they expect a certain thing. They expect the language to come out of your mouth to be good. They expect your attitude to be good. They would expect you to be happy because if you're thinking you're going to heaven and, and if you're a Christian you, you, and you're right with God, you are. But why, if you're not happy about that, why would they want to be involved with that? Does that make sense? So, so we, you know, when they look at us, they, we see certain things that are expectations. But their demand, Israel's demand for a king would forever change their arrangement, their function, and the direction of the nation. And you think about that, when nations make decisions, many times it forever changes that direction. Now remember, don't forget that God is always in control and things happen sometimes that, that we would not whether they happen, but they do. They believe that the replacement of the ruler of Yahweh with human institutions would be better able to guarantee the security of the nation. So they're worried about, it seems to be, the physical security of the nation. In other words, the nations are, their armies are bigger, they might be able to come in there and meet our armies. Well, every nation seems to worry about that a little bit. Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 through 20 is a, a kind of a lengthy scripture. Now, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 8. I don't want you to miss this. We're going back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy was written long before Samuel was born, thought of, or anything else. Long before the judge system even started, back when they are a father rule system, for a matter of fact, long, long ago. But let's see what Deuteronomy says about this situation that we're talking about today. 
Verse 14 says, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me. God, how did you know that was going to happen? Well, God just knows these things, doesn't he? This is prophecy we're looking at, actually, in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, there's not a whole lot of prophecy in some of these books, but you see this here. Then it goes on, verse 15. You shall surely set a king over you, you whom the Lord your God chooses. Okay, so God's going to be involved. From among our countrymen, you shall set a king as or king over yourselves, you may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. There's some good king rules here, or leadership rules, I would call these. And these are leadership rules that any nation could use at any point in time or even in 2024. Why would you put someone who's not a member of our country in charge of the country? That doesn't make sense. And God's saying that doesn't make sense. Be careful what you do. Then he goes on, moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. In other words, you're not going backwards in time. You know, you should be going frontwards in time. You should be progressing in those areas. He shall not multiply wives for himself or else his heart will turn away, nor shall he greatly increase silver or gold for himself. In other words, it, this leader should basically not get rich from this position. That shouldn't happen. He shouldn't have anything more, the way this seems to read, is he shouldn't have anything more than the common man. Now, a lot of times we take a king or ruler or whatever in many countries and we lift them up, we give them silver, we give them gold, and, and, and that happened in the Bible too, didn't it? We give them all these luxury things because they're in the position that they're into and they, they don't seem to know what's going on. But, you know, we see this, verse 18, now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of, of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law, of this law, on a scroll, in the presence of the Levitical priests, it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn it to fear the Lord his God, be careful observing all the words of the law and the statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. God shows us in every portion of the Bible how to live a life. And here he says, if you want to be a king, you go back to my word, you go back to the word of God, you learn it, you study it day, night, every single day. Don't go from the right or go from the left. That's what you need to rely on. And of course, Israel had issue with that. Because they were worried about worldly things. But when we think of this king, nevertheless, the king would be required to rule as God directed him. We even know that from the book of Romans, chapter 13 in the New Testament, that God appoints our government system for us even today. Well, secondly, uh, at least to Solomon, or Samuel, excuse me, Samuel, Samuel, at least to Samuel, the request was displeasing. Now, I believe it was displeasing to God, but I believe that God kind of foresaw this and knew it was going to happen. Kind of like a parent knows when things are going to happen. God, you know, kind of was at the watching eye. He had predicted it, it would happen. He gave the rules to how it could happen and things like that. Uh, Samuel had, had no idea. So we see in verse 6 and 7, but the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when he said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. What do you do when you're upset? You pray. Here's his example. You pray. Oh, Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they, watch this, have re not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me, God, from being king over them. 
Now we're talking in the New Testament, so we're talking about who? Jesus, King Jesus. We just got done a few minutes ago singing a song. He is my what? King. Now we could, I, I was told this by a preacher once, I believe it's true, we could sing a lie just as much as we can say a lie. So when we sing, we always have to make sure the songs we're singing and the words we're singing are what we believe that they're biblical. Sometimes that's not always the case. But if we believe that Jesus is our king, then he is the one who rules our life. He's the one who rules our heart. He's the one that we need to be concerned with. Samuel prayed for the Lord. I want you to notice this for advice. He needed advice. This is once again one of those things that is, that is sprinkled or, or highlighted throughout the Bible. When we need advice, who do we go to? God. Certainly, Solomon, the third king, did that. And there's record of him doing that. Others throughout Scripture do that. Well, when they need advice, Pray to God. That's so important when we're making a decision in our life. When things are going on, pray to God. And so Samuel was likely disappointed in the people and probably saw their request for a king to judge them as, as a personal insult against him. And God says, no, that's not against me. Or God, that's not against you, Samuel. That's against me. They've rejected me from being king over them. And so Israel had rejected God's rulership. Ooh. Hang on. Let me say that again. Israel had rejected God's rulership. Now, let me ask you, does that happen today? Do people in our world reject God's rulership? When basically God comes and rules in our life. Now that means that God's going to give us things that we need to obey. And many times, we disobey them, don't we? We see that all throughout Scripture, Cain and Abel, one good, one bad. One obedient, one disobedient. And, and so we understand the way this works. In Acts chapter 13 and, and verse 20 and 22, after these things, he gave them judges. So, so Luke talking about this time here, after these things, God gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. And then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the, the son of Kish, remember that, a, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. Well, we know, we look at, we could study the life of Saul, the king, and, you know, that was a rough run. Out of the three kings, and you compare them, Saul, David, and um, Solomon. And you say, okay, which one had the roughest run? Probably King Saul. He had a rough run. 40 years, though, so he's, he, you know, he's putting forth effort, but he has a lot of difficulties in that time and a lot of things going on. But they asked for a king. God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, and, and a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years after he had removed him. Who removed him? God removed him. When, when God was good and ready to remove him, he raised up David to be their king concerning whom he testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse. Well, you know, what do we know about David? Well, we know quite a bit about David. What's our first thing we remember? We remember David as a young lad and, and they went to find a king and, and, and all these big sons of Jesse's came out tall and strapping and handsome and all these things that you want a king and said, no, 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 no. And finally, here's Jesse in the field tending sheep. The, the, the short, unattractive guy, that's the guy. He goes up against who? Goliath, the, the giant. And, and David says, who is this man that can go against God? Well, David believed, didn't he? And God would say, a man after my heart will do my, do all of my will, or who will do all my will, excuse me. 
Well, when we jump over to Hosea chapter 13, beginning verse 9, it says, It is your destruction, O Israel, that you are against me, or against your help, excuse me, where now is your king that he may save you in all my cities and your judges whom you requested. Give me a king and princes. I gave you a king. My anger took him away in my wrath. You see, although in chapter 8 it doesn't appear that God's angry with this, he, he, he was. He wasn't really happy with it. He, he was kind of on the same side there as our good buddy. Samuel was. And finally, John 15, verse 20, remember the word I say to your slave is no greater than his master. If they persecute me, they'll persecute you. If they keep my word, they will keep yours also. Well, lastly, not only did they ask for a king, but not only was at least Samuel displeased, and, and it appears that God was displeased with their decision, but they followed evil. Now, we probably all remember games we played as kids. And going out to Bible camp is, is an awesome experience because it kind of refreshes your memory of games you play with kids. Because, especially my week, because I have seven-year-olds to eleven-year-olds and those are what? Kids. And, and so we, you know, to kill time many times, we play some games. And they're childhood games. You know, um, Simon says, remember that one? <laughs> Simon says, raise your hand. Everybody raise their hand. Simon says, raise your foot. And you go on, and then you say, you would just say, raise your left, your right foot. And you catch them all, Simon didn't say. Well, that's kind of what they're doing here. They're not looking at the good example. They're looking what? At the bad example example and following exactly what the bad example is. And, and, and it's interesting because sometimes that's easy to do. Sometimes it's easy to follow evil. Satan makes it easy to follow evil in this world. When we get to chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, we notice this. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day I brought them from Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me. You know, when someone does something nice for you, you kind of, hopefully you remember that for a little bit. God did something nice for Israel, didn't he? They were in slavery in Egypt. And you keep on say, seeing this. I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt earlier in, in Deuteronomy. In Deuteron they don't want to go back to that. They don't want to go back to slavery. No, I brought you 400 years of slavery. I brought you up out of that. You, do you forget where you were? And here we see, since that day I brought you up from where? Egypt. Even to this day, they forsaken me. They, they just did, didn't do what they're supposed to do. They served other gods. So they are, are doing it to you also. Now then listen to their voices, how you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of procedure of the king who will reign over them. In other words, Israel, be careful because there will be a king that reigns over you and he's not going to care for you like God cares for you. Oh, no, that won't be the case. That will be the case. Now, when we go back to Exodus chapter 32, Exodus chapter 32, we notice in verse 1 through 4, Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, this is kind of the big uh, example of a large group of people going, what I would call, say, going off the rails. Now, you've got a bunch of problems here. If we just stand outside, kind of look and say, okay, let's analyze what these people did wrong. We like doing that, don't we? Let's look at what somebody else did wrong. Okay, well, they were not, what, 
First, first problem is they were not patient. With God, sometimes you have to be what? Patient, because God works in his own time. He's not a microwave God like we'd like him to be. You know, we'd like to say, God, uh, by the time I get done with this prayer, I expect you to answer this prayer. No, he doesn't work like that. He works, he has his help schedule, he works in his own time. We have to be patient. We see good examples of that with, with people like Job. Job was patient. You know, Moses had a lot of patience. So now when the people saw Moses delay coming down from the mountain, uh, hey, Moses went up into the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. He's supposed to come back down from the mountain to present the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. He goes up, the people are standing there waiting, and say, well, when's he coming back down? Look at the time he should be here by now. He's not coming back, is he? He's not coming back at all. So what they do? That's the kind of attitude they have. That they, they people assembled about Aaron. So Aaron, Moses' brother, the high priest, and they came to him, and Aaron should know better, but he didn't, I guess. Hey, make us a gold, make us a God who will go before us for this. Moses, the man who brought us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, okay, and Aaron sounds like he's game pretty quick, isn't he? Okay, uh, uh, tear off all the gold earrings which are in the ears of your wives. So if I started going to my wife and pulling off her earrings, she might have something to say about that, but you know, that's, that's what they did. Take all the gold. You got gold rings on, take them off. Put, put the gold in. Everybody put their gold on the table. Put their gold down here. Tear them off. They all brought him to Aaron. And he took from this, from their hand, and fashioned it with a gravy tool, made it into a molded calf, and said, This is your God. O Israel, who brought you out from the land of the Oh, so much wrong there. First of all, Aaron should have said, okay, y'all need to be patient. Moses will come down when God is ready for him to what? Come down. Just wait. But they, but they suggested, they suggested, well, that's a great idea. Get to go, get to go, get to go. Let's, uh, let's carve something out of here. Here's, now this, here, I've made a little calf out of all these earrings. This is your God. Not only is this your God, this is the God that we're going to give credit now to, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. No, he wasn't. And shame on you, Aaron, for saying that. So we know it's going downhill from there now. This was the, the first we see images at that big of a level, if you will. Judges chapter 2 and verse 19. But it came about when the judge died. What did they do when the judge died? That they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers. You know, it's interesting that it uses the word here, more corruptly. In other words, okay, my father was this corrupt. If I'm the exact same corruptness as my father, I'm going to be right here. But I was more. Each generation was farther off the track. Like, how can you be that? In following other gods and serving them and bowing down to them, they did not abandon their practices and stubborn ways. Notice the practices of stubborn way, not the doctrines of the word of God. Judges chapter 10, verses 10 through 12, that the sons of Israel cried out, saying, We have sinned against you, for indeed we have forsaken our God and served Baals. That, that they came back, and I, we don't have time tonight as we we, we begin to close to, to look at all this, but they begin to came back many times. Verse 14 says, uh, go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. You've chosen these other gods. Go cry to them. You know, God's instructions may have been considerably milder than Samuel might have expected. Samuel might want God to, to kind of put a, no, you're not going to have a king, but God said, listen to him, Samuel. Okay, that's the way they want to go. Listen, if that's the way they want to go, they can go that way. But in the end, there'll be a price to pay. 
I don't think our world is much different from that now. If that's the way they want to go, God will, I'm still in control. I, you know, we'll see what happens in the last day, but we'll let them have to pay the price. The last command simply means tell Israel how he would treat them. Well, chapter 10, verse 25 says this, Then Samuel told the people the ordinance of the kingdom and wrote them in the book, placed it before the Lord, and Samuel sent all the people away, each to his own house. So basically he told them, if you want a king, it may not be exactly like you think it's going to be. It may be different. It certainly it was, as you look at the history of, of the kings. Tonight, there's one king that we need to worry about, and that's King Jesus. Is he king of your life? Is he lord of your life? He's the one that we need to focus on. He's the one that's most important. If you're not yet been baptized into Christ, make him king of your life, we encourage you to do that. Or maybe you've done that and you need prayers. We pray to God through Jesus Christ, that King, to give you strength in your story. Won't you come as we stand as we sing? Have our affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Dost thou help all things for Jesus? But lost is thy heart right with God. Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson blood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the supper this morning. If you'll come to the front pew, you'll be served. It's still the first day of the week. The Lord's Supper is still prepared for those who couldn't be here this morning. Uh, so, would you Take of these items that uh, Jesus set aside in order to perform this ceremony. Just please uh, stay focused on the suffering that Christ went through to uh, do this for us. He died willingly. He didn't have to, but he willingly died. 
to pay the price so that we can have a chance for eternal life. Let's give thanks for the bread. Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings you've given us, and thank you, Father, for this bread. Please bless that, and, uh, bless those that partake of it, and please let them take it, Father, on the way pleasing unto you. It's the bread that represents Christ's body that hung on the cross. And through uh, Jesus' name we pray. Father, we're thankful again for this fruit of the vine that uh, represents Christ's blood. And Father, without this blood, we would have no chance at all to, to, to flow down through you that day on Calvary's cross and it washed away our sins. Please, Father, again, let it be taken in a way pleasing to you and uh, let those uh, that partake of it uh, bless them and bless this fruit of the vine. In Jesus' name we pray. This concludes the uh, Lord's Supper. Now, as a matter of convenience, we have an opportunity to give back a little of that that we earned uh, to, for the work of the church. Is there anything else that needs to be announced? Bow with me and we'll have a short prayer and be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day of life that we've had today. Thank you for the lessons of your word that we've had today. Thank you so much, Father, for the blessing that you have. And we ask that you be with us, Father, as we leave here tonight to go to our individual homes. Be with us and keep us safe and let us return for the next point in time. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.